that Mark has already mentioned about uh, about tonight and the associational meeting that's going on. And uh, I kind of gave uh, gave word about it last week that uh, you know we're part of this association. We support the association financially and through other resources. And uh, I just think it's important that uh, you know we're hosting that tonight. And I just think it's important that we know what's going on in our association. And not only that, but there has been. Um, in recent uh, in recent weeks and months, uh, especially ever since the convention, there has been uh, there's been some shakeup that has gone on within the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, most notably, this uh, this past week, the uh, the president of the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention has resigned his position, as well as uh, as well as some other big shakeups. But that's the that's the biggest one. That's the easiest one to point toward. But there's been a lot of other things that has been going on. And the issues that are surrounding that, and I would just encourage you to be here. Um, I, I have um, I, I've requested that there be an update and there be an explanation of all that's going on because I don't think that most people are familiar with what is happening. They hear some sound bites, and usually those sound bites are coming from the mainstream media. Uh, the la- <laughs> the last thing that we need is for the media to be explaining what's going on in our convention. Um, and so I, w- I would just encourage you to be here. I, I hope that that's going to come to fruition. If it doesn't, then I'll, I'll be sure and do something about that next week uh, here and, and make sure that you are aware. But, uh, but anyway, so I encourage you to be here just to find out what's up in the convention, in the association, and all that's going on. Like I said last week, uh, normally when people hear associational meetings, they're thinking, you know, three, four hours. They're thinking midnight and those kind of things. But, uh, but really... This service is only supposed to go maybe an hour and 15, something like that, because they want to they want to pack a worship service as well as some uh, some information in there. And so, uh, so you'll be here tonight for that. I'm, I appreciate singing Amazing Grace here today. Uh, I know that uh, many of you love that hymn, and uh, I've always heard that it's called the, uh, the Baptist National Anthem, and so uh, it's certainly appropriate for today. And the reason is, is that human nature naturally gravitates towards seeking to earn God's favor and acceptance. Let me, let me say that again. Human nature gravitates towards seeking to, to get and to earn God's favor and acceptance. It's really where we get the religions of the world. Most all religions of the world, they pick up on this, they promote it, and they work toward earning God's favor. Even, even secularists, that's the funny thing, even secularists, when they're thinking about the beyond this life, it's all about this earning of acceptance. And that's precisely why none of them save. Last week we talked about solus Christus, Christ alone, and in Christ alone we are saved. And it's because... It's because people are, they're addressing the wrong problem. They're missing the point. And really, even within the church, we lean toward that as well. I've got a, uh, let let me pull out my phone. I'm not suggesting it for everyone, but uh, it's not sinful necessarily. I, um, I, I, let me point to a, to a song by Alan Jackson. Y'all like Alan Jackson? Some of you are country music fans, you like Alan Jackson. Let me read, let me read the, the chorus to his song, Where I Come From, which is a catchy tune. I mean, I like, you know, I like the song. And here's what the chorus says. It says, I said, where I come from, it's cornbread and chicken. You, you know that's a country song when they talk about cornbread and chicken. Nothing wrong with that. I like cornbread and chicken. Where I come from, a lot of front porch sitting. Where I come from, trying to make a living and working hard to get to heaven, where I come from. Working hard to get to heaven, where I come from. There are a lot of people in church today. There are probably some people in this church today. There are probably some people who are watching online. They're all over. They're filling the churches, even within the churches, and they're working hard to get to heaven. That is where we have gotten it wrong. The problem problem with all of this is sola gratia. Or if you if you like the uh, if if you want to pronounce it a different way, sola gratia. But we're going to go with sola gratia. 
That really flies in the face of sola gratia in grace alone. Sola meaning solo, alone. Gratia, the Latin word for grace, in grace alone. I want you to invite you to turn your, in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to begin in the first verse as soon as we figure out how we got there. How did we get to the point where we have to lift up this Latin phrase, grace alone? And to, to figure that out, we've got to go all the way back to the 5th century. We've got to have a, a, just a quick history lesson all the way back to the 5th century, the, the 400s after Christ. And it really began with this guy that you have heard of. I don't know how well you know him. You at least know his city. Starts with St. Augustine. And in his confessions, in his great work, the confessions, he expressed in a belief in our reliance upon God only to do God's will. In other words, God's grace. And in response, you know, it doesn't matter. In fact, on my, on my way over here, I stopped and I was talking with someone who was, uh, who was standing outside. He's one of our, uh, uh, what, what do you call it, safety personnel who's watching over us right now. I don't know if you know, but every time you come in here, we have... We were surrounded by safety personnel who were keeping us safe. And one of them, I, I, uh, I stopped by and, and uh, I was talking with him for a second. And he, um, he, he said something about, y'all to do this. And I said, well, it, you know, some people won't like it if I do that. And he's like, oh, so you make people happy all the time? I'm like, yeah, of course I do. No, no, it doesn't happen. It doesn't really matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you say, what you believe, what you preach. Somebody's going to have a problem with it. And Augustine was standing up and he was simply saying, it's, it's by grace and grace alone. God is the one who, is empower, who empowers us to do God's will. And there was a man, a British monk, who objected to what Augustine was teaching. This, this British monk, his name was Pelagius. And Pelagius didn't believe what, where Augustine was going with all this. He, he believed that if God commanded something... That man was naturally, and when I say naturally, it means apart from the supernatural, apart from God's grace, that man was naturally able to do what God had, had told him to do. And this was possible because he believed that Adam's sin, the sin of way back in the book of Genesis, that Adam's sin affected Adam only. And that all human beings were born in the same state that Adam was born in. Meaning... That he was capable in and of himself to either obey God or to disobey God. And if they obey God, if, if you and I, if we obey God, then, then that merits, then our works, our good works merit salvation. And if we disobey God, then we earn God's punishment. I mean, a lot of people, you know, that, that really rings true with a lot of people even within the church. We do the right thing. God likes us, God accepts us, God saves us, and if we don't do the right thing, then God is going to punish us. Augustine, though, believed that Adam's sin had dramatically impacted all of his descendants, the whole human race, that's you and me. So much so that we couldn't do it ourselves, we had to have God's grace. And even though the church in that time, even though that, that early church, that church for the first several hundred or even over a thousand years condemned Pelagius and what he taught. Pelagius, what his, his, uh, the teachings that followed him was called Pelagianism. And what they, what they believed was is they condemned it. They called it a heresy. But yet it partially gained a permanent foothold in the church. Justification or salvation was seen as a, like, a, like a cooperative work between God and and the sinner. They kind of work together in order to get salvation. It's not that the, it's not that the church of that day, that the, the Catholic church of that day rejected the teaching of God's grace. I mean, they didn't reject it wholeheartedly. If the church had simply, if the church had simply, or the reformers, if they had simply stood up and said, it is prima gratia. Prima meaning primary. Like, first, foremost, the most important thing was God's grace. If they had simply said that, everything would have been fine. But to insist that it was only grace, nope, couldn't go there. Here was their, here was their response. Here was their statement. 
God will, de- will not deny His grace to those who do what lies within them. He does not deny His grace to those who, who, uh, who do what lies within them. Now you might be saying, well, what, what does that mean? Let me, let, me, let me give you the phrase for today. Here it is. Y'all ready? You've heard this before. God helps those who help themselves. You know there are a lot of folks who believe that's in the Bible? That's not in the Bible. It's nowhere in the Bible. In fact, you know where it came from? You might know. Benjamin Franklin. That's not Bible. God, it's not that... Now, there, there may be some areas in life where God helps those who help themselves, but it has nothing to do with salvation. When it comes to salvation, it is not that God helps those who help themselves. But that was what was, that was, what it was accepted. That was what was embraced then as well as it is now. It just happened to be a church doctrine of that day. And that's what gave rise to, you know, when I was introducing this series, I talked about the sale of indulgences. That's really where that came out of. It, the sale of indulgences, an indulgence was really just a piece of paper. And if you paid somebody, if you paid the right people for that piece of paper, a, 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 a priest for that paper, they would hand it to you and that would merit you forgiveness. That would, that would convey merit for you or maybe even your loved ones. So here's the Bible's response. Romans chapter 11 and verse 6. But, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. If you want to take grace and add works to it, add what you bring to the table, if you want to add, if you want to add your works to grace, it's no longer grace. You have eliminated the very definition of grace. Grace is is God's gift to us so that the reformer's response was sola gratia. It's by grace and grace alone. Listen, you and I bring nothing to the table. There, there's, nothing that, there's nothing that you do. There's nothing that you have. There's nothing that you have done. There's nothing that you think. There's nothing that you believe. There's nothing that you've taught. There's nothing that you've ever said. There's nothing that you and I bring to the table that impresses God. It is by grace alone. So what does it mean? That's where Ephesians chapter 2 comes in. So if you have your outline, I hope you have uh, have that. You can get it when you come in. Uh, Either entrance, you can get it online under the resources tab as you're watching there online. Here is what it means. At first, under that section, it talks about the problem of sin. If we want to understand grace and grace alone, we must begin with the problem of sin. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in the very first verse, it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit which is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly walked in the lusts of our flesh, and indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature. This is is who we are naturally, without, without some kind of an intervention. We were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. You you think about the most lost person that you know. You are in the same camp. Because even as the rest, just like everybody else. This is the problem of sin. So it begins with this. Number one, there in your outline is original sin. Original sin as evidenced in our behavior. You know, there are several passages that, uh, that we think about. Uh, we can, we, we, uh, first of all, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, you can write that reference down. You can turn to it if, you, if you'd like to. Um, but for the sake of time, I'll, I'll go ahead. Just write down Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. It says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. You see, from Adam we inherited a sin nature, and it is a catastrophic effect upon all of us. Now somebody might say, well, that's not fair. It's not fair that that I inherited the sin, and now I've got to pay the penalty for that. And and, and listen, I I guess logically speaking, you might say, hey, it's not fair. You're right, it is not fair. But that doesn't mean that it's not a fact. 
doesn't mean that it's not true. We were having, uh, in, in our Sunday school class this morning, we were talking about several different things, and somehow we got off on allergies. And Darren was talking about, the, he had an allergy tests, and they, they did all kind of stuff to his arms, and his arms swole up and got all red and nasty and all that kind of stuff. Where did allergies come? They were passed down from generation to generation to generation. He, got it. he, didn't, he didn't do anything to, to deserve that. It's just what he got. Same thing is true with our sin nature. It may or may not be fair. You can argue that all you want, but it doesn't change the reality that we have inherited a sin nature and it has a catastrophic effect upon our relationship with God. To the point where you have Jesus himself saying that there is none righteous. There, there is no one good except for God. The Bible says there are none righteous. No, not one. Isaiah said all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. You see, this is who we are. We are by nature sinful human beings. And it's really not that hard to see. It's not hard, that hard to pick up on. You don't have to teach your kids to sin. They just learn how to do it. That you don't have to teach them how to rebel. They just do it. We have original sin. So then you notice there that I, I, I try to do this stuff um, uh, intentionally. Original sin as evidenced in our behavior. So if you're taking notes there in the outline, I would encourage you to underline the word evidenced. Evidenced in our behavior. And the reason is, is that our behavior, the things that we do and the things that we say that we call sinful and that are sinful, those are just symptoms of the problem. Let me just tell you something. I got COVID about a month ago, maybe a little bit more than that, a couple of months ago. I had COVID. Woke up one day, I went out on a Friday and I was, I, I, I blame it on, on Glenn, it's his fault, because we were playing golf and all of a sudden my throat started hurting. So I didn't tell Glenn that this is what I was asking, but I was like, so Glenn, how did, when, you, when you had COVID, how did, you like, how did it start out for you? He's like, oh, I had a sore throat. I'm like, oh gosh, here we go. I had a sore throat. I had a headache. Anybody had COVID? Y'all had the same kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Had a little bit of fever and all that. So when I got home that night, I started, you know, I started panicking with all this stuff. I didn't really panic, but I thought, I, I need to address this. So I started taking my vitamins. I mean, like, like having vitamins was all, the, all of a sudden going to make me not have COVID anymore, right? I took, man, I took Motrin, popping that stuff like candy, you know? And what I was doing was I was taking care of my headache, taking care of some, some fever and, and those kind of things. But those weren't the problem. The, the problem was is I had a, I had a virus. And nothing that I was doing was doing anything to that virus. I was only addressing symptoms, right? The real issue was a lot deeper than that. And the same is true with us and our nature and our problem and our behavior. Our behavior, when we sin against, when we sin against God, it's just, a, it's just a symptom of what the problem is that goes, it goes a lot deeper. So that I can go through and I can try to, like, and I've talked about this before in here, I can go through and I can, like, improve my behavior and I can change my language and I can start trying to do the right thing and I can make it look good in front of other people and I can be very sincere. The only problem is, is I am taking medicine. I'm taking medicine to deal with symptoms rather than dealing with the real problem. That's why good works don't help us because good works aren't what the issue is. It's not what goes down to the core. The issue is our nature, who we are at our core, who we really are. And who we really are, according to Scripture, is we are sinners. We are dead in our trespasses in sin. So that the result, in your outline there, the result is spiritual death. Spiritual death. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. And, and rearranging priorities in our lives and, and you know, trying to make changes and you know, pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and all that kind of stuff. Listen, all that stuff is great. It's got its place. But you're only dealing with symptoms. Because the, symptom, the, the problem, the real problem is, is that you are dead in trespasses and sins. That's the, that's the problem. The first, what we're talking about, sola gratia, when we're talking about grace alone, 
it begins with the problem of sin. But thank God it doesn't end there because then we have the provision of God. So let's pick up where we left off there in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. It says, but God, and I would love to go back and, and preach these really more in depth, but I'm going with what I've got today. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trans transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith, that's next week, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's not as a result of works because works isn't the problem. We have here the provision of God. And here, here are three, and there, there are probably others, but I believe that these most, most accurately uh, address the issue that we have. Number one, the first provision of God is Christ who gives us life. Christ who gives us life. Remember we talked about last week about Christ alone, it's only in Jesus? It's because He's the only one that can address the real problem. The real problem is that we are dead and in Christ we have life. That's what we just got finished reading here. We also see in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4, Paul says, Christ who is our life. As we go through, at least in my Sunday school class, we've been going through 1 John. John, first, John is using two illustrations primarily to talk about the old and the new. One is we've gone from darkness into light. The other thing that he says is we have gone from death to life. We are spiritually dead because that's who we are at our core. And the only one who can, who can rectify that issue is Jesus who is our life. The second thing he gives us is faith. The faith to believe. You want to know why it's all of Jesus? You want to know why it's all about him? Why it has nothing to do with us? Because even our capacity to believe in him comes from him. That's what we just read in verse 8. And I know I've talked about this before, but in case you weren't here to hear that, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. What is that? What is it referring to? What is the antecedent if you're an English major? Antecedent is faith. That not The faith isn't even from you. That is a gift of God. The capacity to believe even comes from Him. And so in doing that, when He gives us Christ, when He gives us the faith to, to believe and to receive Christ, that leads to our third provision from God that just comes from His grace, nothing that we earn. And that is the righteousness that God requires. Keep your finger there in Ephesians chapter 2, but I want you to turn back just a, just a couple of books to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I've said it before, I, I, really, I really hope I have the freedom one day to preach on the great, extra, the great exchange. There are so many times in the Bible where God is willing to exchange what we have for what He has. And what He has is a whole lot better than what we have. And here is, here is one of the places that I will begin. It probably would be the first place that I would run to. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and the way that he ends that chapter in verse 21 says that he, meaning God, made him, meaning Jesus, made, God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Now, no, notice, notice here, it's a nature issue. He didn't, just, he didn't just throw our sins. He said that he made him to be sin. He imputed, he, he, um, he transferred our sinfulness over to Christ. He put our very nature upon Him. And He made Jesus out to be sin on our behalf. And what do we get in exchange for that? So that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. It's a, this is a legal declaration that takes place. Yesterday, my, uh, my daughter's softball team uh, they had a uh, they had a, a fundraising golf tournament, 
and we had some folks who showed up. There were some, some of the, the men from the church here who came, and they, they played in that golf tournament, and uh, I, I, I appreciate them doing that and supporting the team. And they got up there, they got up there to, to pay. They got up there to pay for their part. And, and suddenly they said, well, yours, your, your green fees has already been paid for. That's, that's not bad. They're like, well, who, who paid for it? We don't know, but it says that it's been paid for. And none of them fessed up. I don't, I don't know, which to, still to this time, at least if they, if they know they haven't told me, we have no idea who paid for it. But here's the thing is they had, in, an, in, in essence, they walked up there believing that they had a debt. And that debt was eliminated. Somebody took that burden upon themselves much the same way that Jesus took our sin nature upon himself. And then what he did was, that was a transaction that took place. In this case, yesterday it was a financial transaction. In this case with with God, it's a legal transaction. That sin which you had has now been removed from you. But that's not all. He then said, you know what? The righteousness that is Christ, that is required to have a relationship with God the Father, has now been granted unto you. Now, how does that happen? I mean, we talked about we got to be holy even as God is holy. And here he's given us, this is how that happens. And I, uh, uh, my, I, I've got a, a, an app on my phone. This is for my bank. And I've got, uh, I've got a few different accounts that, uh, that, I, that I have that are that uh, the, some of them I share with, with, uh, like with my daughter at school. And, um, and so it's really neat because I can go in there and I can, I, I can pull up that app and at the bottom it says, it says transfer. And so if my daughter, who is a way away from me, if she needs some money like immediately, all I got to do is go in there and hit transfer and I put the account where it's coming from, the account where it's going to, and suddenly she has money. Boom, just like that. And it's kind of like what God does for us in our righteousness. I mean, our bank account, our righteousness bank account is like flat out empty. It is zero. Like I said, we have nothing that we can bring to the table. And so God comes in and he hits that transfer button and he says, Okay, Jesus, all of the righteousness that you have, I am now going to put it on Lane Sanders' account. And now suddenly I am rich in righteousness. That can't happen because I decided to go to church. He doesn't doesn't give me a whole lot of righteousness because I decided to be baptized one day. Check this out. You you, you want to know a scary thought for Baptists who grew up in the, especially those who grew up in the 20th century? He's not going to credit my account because I prayed a prayer. He only credits my account because of Jesus. And in his grace. He has granted me that gift. That's what it is. So God has given us this gift. He's given us this expression of grace. Christ who gives us life. Faith to believe. And then the righteousness that God requires. And all we have to do is to receive that. That's the cool thing. All we got to do is receive that. Now, Here's what a thinking person, here's how a thinking person might respond. And I would so much appreciate if somebody were thinking ahead like this, that they were to say, well, hold on now, you said you got to receive this. I thought there was nothing that we had to do. How is it that we get it? If there's nothing that we can do, well, and, 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 then, and still be able to say, well, it was Jesus and Jesus alone. Well, it's not hard. It's not hard. i got a birthday coming up. And to me, I, I don't know if I've shared this with you, but one of the greatest illustrations for grace to me is a birthday gift. I'm not asking for a birthday gift. I'm just saying that birthdays are on my mind. And so a a birthday gift. Now you think about that. On my birthday, people are going to, people are going to give me cards. You know, my family, they're going to, they're going to give me gifts. People are going to come up to me and they're going to say, happy, you know, happy birthday. They're going to, they're going to pat me on the back. I'm like, what did I do for that? You ever thought about that? What did, what did you do? To get a birthday gift on your birthday. You didn't do nothing. You were just, you knew where you were there. You were there. Your, your parents should get, your mama especially should be the one to get gifts on your birthday. Because she's the one who had to put up with you. Right? But you're the one who gets it. For doing absolutely nothing. Just because you are. That 
That is grace. Now, if you, so, so let's just say, let's just say that, that my wife gets me a gift. And she comes up to me, she says, here, Lane, happy birthday. And I go, why, thank you. And I hold out my hand, and she puts it in my hand. And I, I bring it up, and I, you know, I open it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, all that kind of stuff. And then I walk away, and I walk away from there, and I'll be like, hmm, I earned that gift, didn't I? Man, I had to work for that gift because I held up my hand. I had to open up the bow, take off that paper, you know, open up the, uh, open up the box that it's in. I really earned that birthday gift. That is, that's crazy. That's, that, that's ludicrous to even think that. No, that, that birthday gift is totally a gift. And I did nothing to earn that. So when we come to Jesus, Jesus has already offered. God has offered us Christ. God has offered us eternal life. He's offered us forgiveness. He's offered us His grace. And all we have to do is just receive it. And He gets all the glory. So if it's not about works, if it's not not grace plus works, then what is the place of good works? And the answer for that is in the very next verse. In verse 10, where we left off, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We are saved not just from the penalty of our sins, but from the power of sin, so that we are released to do good works. It comes as a result. And so let me me give you three uh, three sentences or, or phrases that help explain the place of works. Number one, it is the good works are the result of a new nature. I mean, if, if we sin because that's just who we are, well, we do good works because of now who we are, because He has given us a new nature. In other words, these are things that we don't really have to think about. It's what the Spirit is doing within us to change us and to make us more like Christ. It is the result of a new nature. It is proof of a new nature. But number two, It is also the response of a thankful follower. Gratitude is the word. I recognize that I was was lost and hopeless apart from Christ. And there was nothing that I could do do about it. But Jesus, Jesus, God the Father gave us the Son. He granted to me the grace to be saved. And so I am thankful and I want to live my life for Him. So the result of a new nature is that we don't have to think about it, but the gratitude is when we do think about it. It's like like snowballing in this good works. But then also the place of good works is to bring glory to God. Write down uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. There are many other verses that, that really surprised me as I was studying through this. But let me just, let me just summarize it with Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. And really Paul was saying the same thing here in Ephesians chapter 2. We do it so that other people will know. We do it, again, it's part of the gratitude thing, but we, we want to really highlight God and what He's done for us. That is what sola gratia means. We bring nothing, God brings everything, and it makes all the difference. Now, why does it still matter? Let me just, let me just give you two things. and The, the second one, I'm, well, I'll, I'll cover both of them pretty quickly here. Here's why, it, here's why it still matters to this day. Because truth doesn't change, let me just tell you. Your salvation hinges upon this. This should matter a great deal as you examine your own self and what you call your salvation. It hinges upon this. Because it's not, it's not grace plus anything. Grace plus me trying or Me going through this ritual. It's not grace plus anything. Because if it's grace plus anything, that's not grace. And if it's not grace, it's not from God. And therefore you have no relationship with God. Your salvation hinges upon grace and grace alone. But then God is still still, um, uh, shedding His grace upon us to this day. 
to this moment. In other words, it's not just an issue of salvation. God, and so there are, to this day, there are means of God's grace. In other words, how He is showering His grace upon us. And I simply want to touch on the, what we call the Westminster Confession, which is a great confession of, uh, of what the Reformers were trying to get across to us. And there are three, three ways that, uh, three means of God's grace to us still in this, in this day in which we live. The first is the word preached. The word preached. Now, there are, there are a lot of other activities that people use to try to replace the preaching. People want to minimize preaching. Hey, can you, you know, can you just do like a 10-minute deal kind of deal? Um, maybe we could show some videos. Or uh, one, of, one of my favorites is when, uh, whenever you have, you have a, a service of, of music and, uh, and somebody will kind of walk up to me, <laughs> walk up to the preacher and be like, you know, I, I know there was no preaching, but man, that, was, that really filled my soul. I can understand that for a service or two, but um, as, a, as a regular diet, you cannot replace the word preached. There are things that are more entertaining. In fact, there are other ways that you might even be able to learn more. But it just so happens that God has, he has instituted the preaching of the word in order to dispense his grace to his followers. There is the sacraments. And for us, we believe that there are two. There are baptism and there is the Lord's Supper. Baptism, of course, is a, an encouragement for us to see those who are coming into the faith. It means a lot to those who are actually baptized. The Lord's Supper, there are all kinds of uh, opinions on how often it should be taken, how it should be done, and those kinds of things. Rather than getting wrapped up in all that, I just pray that as we do it, when we do it, that it will be meaningful, meaningful for you and take new relevance for you every time we do it because that is God extending His grace, reminding, of, reminding us of His grace and drawing us back to the fold. And there is prayer. Pre the, the Word preached, the sacraments, and prayer. And then to that I would add one other. As I have studied and heard other uh, other uh, great preachers, I would add the church. The church is the means of God's grace today, which a lot of these are coming out of the church, so that could certainly be connected in that way. But we have a tendency to think that church is man's response to God. In the beginning, there were some guys who got together and they, they were following Jesus, they had the same ideas about Jesus, and so they kind of gravitated toward one another, and out of that was born the church. And to this day, we think, well, hey, I'm going you know, to go to church because there are other believers, and I appreciate what God has done for me, and so I'm going to go to the church, and that's really where the church was created, on a large scale and on a smaller scale. But that is not true. The church is an act of of God. The church was originated by God. It was created by Him. It is led by Him. And it is the means through which He dispenses His grace upon God's people. So that grace is not a one-time deal. It's not something that, that happened just when you were saved. It is something that follows you all of the days of your life. Grace and grace alone. We're going to sing in just a moment. We're going to sing a a, a hymn that um, I, I was I was hoping that we were I was hoping that we were going to sing. I didn't didn't even mention it, but uh, but it only makes sense. And it talks about God's grace. And I hope that you will sing it with uh, sing it heartily. Grace greater than our sin. Listen to what it says. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe. And so he 
Ends with the chorus. How could you not but sing? Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. We thank God because without it, we would be hopeless. God, thank you for the great gift that you have given to us. The gift of your love, the gift of your forgiveness, the gift of your son, the gift of your acceptance. All that we have from you, not not something that we've strived for. We may have strived for it, but we always came up empty. We always came up short. And so, Lord, you and your kindness and your grace and your mercy, you extended to us that which we could not earn on our own. And I pray for anyone in the sound of my voice, maybe they've never received you. Or may, maybe, maybe they thought that they had. Maybe they thought that they were doing that through all of their good works and through all of their effort and through all of their church activities. And Lord, I pray that you would open their eyes to their need. Their need to receive you and you alone. And Lord, we thank you that when we call upon you, that you save us to the uttermost. Yet another act of your great grace. And so it's that grace that we celebrate now. And so as we lift up our hearts to you and our voices to you and declare your great grace, I pray that it would, uh, it would encourage us as we leave this place, that, uh, that maybe it would convict us, and that it would uh, be a, a, uh, uh, something that would motivate us to share that with others who don't have it or who have not experienced it at least. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand together and sing, Grace that is greater than all our sins.